Supernova 1987A is the closest supernova event since the invention of telescopes. It was first detected in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a companion dwarf galaxy of the Milky Way, some 169,000 light years from Earth. Many suspected supernova explosions have been recorded in history. They stand out due to their sudden brightening and can often outshine the host galaxy for a brief period of time. The mainstream model sees these events as the final chapter in the lives of massive stars. These explosions are thought to create and scatter the heavier elements that stars are not thought to create. In the electric universe, these are thought to be created during an extreme z-pinch in a plasma discharge column. Let's explore Wal Thornhill's paper on Supernova 1987A. To date, astronomers have identified two different types of supernova. Type 1, which are thought to be rarer and between 3 to 10 times brighter than Type 2. They have a broad emission line showing no hydrogen and they exhibit gas speeds on the order of 10,000 km per second. Type 2 tend to spend a greater amount of time at maximum light output and decline more variably and slower than Type 1. By contrast, Type 1 do show hydrogen emission lines and are less broadened than Type 1, indicating gas speeds of a few thousand kilometers per second. In addition to hydrogen, their spectra shows the presence of helium, magnesium, silicon and other elements. Type 1 supernova tend to be very consistent in their light output and that is why they are used as standard candles and hence can be used to measure distances. So where does the idea of the star exploding come from? In 1934, astronomers Bard and Zwicky coined the word supernova and established a theoretical foundation by speculating that they were the result of the collapse of a massive star to form a neutron star. These neutron stars are thought to comprise mainly of neutrons and they would have a very small radius and have extremely high density. For almost 30 years, most scientists considered this proposal far-fetched, but with no alternative model, it was finally accepted. But the model has many untestable assumptions. One particular surprise was the bipolar structure observed in 1987A, and many other similar remnants. Also, many supernova shell remnants did not contain the neutron star that should have been left behind. In this model, type 1 supernova are thought to be the explosions of rare and massive white dwarfs, as they accrete material from a binary companion, but the details of how the star would explode are far from clear. Type 2 supernova require a different explanation and are thought to be better understood. Here it is believed that a super red giant star runs out of thermonuclear energy and initiates a core collapse. So let's look at SN 1987A. This was a type 2 supernova. Analysis of the star at the center of the explosion showed that it had been a blue supergiant, not a red giant star. It was thought that a red giant star 10 times larger was required to initiate a supernova explosion. The model at the time also did not predict the pattern of three rings, nor the pattern of bright beads in the equatorial ring of SN 1987A. And this clearly showed that the material was being ejected equatorially in a thin disk. The other two fainter rings are up to 2.5 light years wide and arranged coaxially above and below the star. They too show bright spots similar to the equatorial ring. Typically, a shock wave from an exploding star should show a spherical rather than an axial symmetry. Attempts have been made to explain the equatorial ring structure using magnetohydrodynamics interacting between the fast and the slow stellar winds. This requires that the star in question was a red supergiant that emitted a steady stellar wind for over 36,000 years before transforming into a blue supergiant with higher speed winds. The evolution of the rings is then based on the pinching of the plasma by collision of the fast, with the earlier slower wind. Attempts to explain the faint rings take the story in a different direction. They require a neutron star or black hole which has material accreted onto it from an orbiting companion which then forms a biaxial processing jet. The beams would be required to stay unbelievably focused. 
the faint beaded structure remains unexplained. The origin of the axial rings is the clue to what is actually going on. Why are they so thin and so nearly circular? Why are they expanding so slowly and why are they beaded? Their shape is far from unique and we see a very similar shape in almost every planetary nebula. We know that plasma flows in large filaments across the universe. These will tend to form a Birkeland current structure. This is force-free aligned and allows them to travel with very little energy loss across vast distances. In the electric universe, it is believed that the Z-pinches are instrumental in the formation of stars along these filaments. We see the stars forming in these filaments and we can trace parts of the Birkeland current using the magnetic fields and radio emissions. So when we examine supernova explosions, we also find that they line up with the galaxy's magnetic field like cosmic compasses, tracing the Birkeland current's direction. When we examine the structure of the Birkeland currents produced in the lab by the likes of Peratt, we clearly see that these form into shells and that these shells then contain a series of smaller filaments. These filaments will tend to create twisting pairs or triplets. Could the bright spots we see around SN1987A be these paired filaments? If the equatorial ring is showing the Birkeland current in the outer sheath of the axial current column, then the supernova outburst may be the result of an intense sea pinch focused on the central star, causing the exploding double layers across the surface of the star. The sea pinch will naturally create the hourglass shape we observe in many of the planetary nebulae. This shape also fits with what we are observing in SN1987A. E. Sanders performed an analysis on supernova explosions that demonstrated that there was a trend in the time interval between multiple supernova occurrences. This strongly suggested some sort of external electrical triggering of these supernova. This, of course, would not really be possible if we viewed stars as isolated thermonuclear entities. But if they are connected via Birkeland currents and powered electrically, this starts to make more sense. Could it be that the vast majority of the electrical energy in the Birkeland current could be dissipated almost instantly upon a single star in a similar manner to an exploding double layer? In the lead up to the event, the star would be under higher electrical stress. This pushes the solar wind out further. In the case of SN1987A, we see that this was a supermassive blue giant, which would have had a considerable discharge in the equatorial region. This plasma potentially would still be in dark mode. At some stage, there is a dramatic rise in the current density, which increases the pinching effect dramatically. This pulls the outer cylinders inwards far more than they were before. This pinching is so strong, it temporarily cuts off the star from the Birkeland current. As the pinch eases slightly, it reconnects, and now the entire Birkeland current discharges onto the surface of the star. So violent is the discharge that it not only creates additional heavier elements in the process, but it also explodes the entire surface double layer. With nothing to hold back the charges, the majority of the material that made up the star races outwards in an explosion. This sudden halt and then flow of charge does not just occur at the star, but also in the cylinders surrounding the star. And this will cause the first cylinder to light up at the equatorial plane where it connects to the solar wind. When the ejected material from the explosion reaches these cylinders some considerable time afterwards, this additional material will cause a further brightening event to occur. At the same time, the current flow further out, above and below the star, also increases. This causes the double layers positioned at these locations to also force the plasma from dark mode into glow mode, creating the faint rings at these latitudes. In most cases, the star is totally destroyed and nothing is left behind, but sometimes a remnant remains, possibly the interior of that star with a more dense material collected. This object is no longer connected or functioning in the same way as before, but the electrical power input continues to drive the magnetospheric circuit of a supernova remnant to produce the characteristic pulsar emissions. The 400-year-old remnant of Kepler's nearby supernova exhibits a 14 light year wide ring of high energy X-ray beads showing the energy is still flowing into this system. 
For more information on pulsars, please see the video that I made on Anthony Peratt's concept of why pulsars produce the regular emissions. Now one final clue might also come from a star that they think might go supernova just like SN 1987A. SBW1 is the catchy name that they have given it. So this is a star that is located in what they think is a planetary nebula. And when we examine the image, something rather familiar jumps out. Here, what they consider a nebula should in fact be viewed as the Birkeland current going from dark mode into glow mode. Here we clearly see the cone part being lit up, as well as the equatorial outflow showing up in glow mode. It is important to realise that we have not witnessed a supernova explosion from beginning to end. SBW1 may well provide many clues as to what might actually be going on. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.